morning, folks. Can I welcome you all to our service here this morning, and for those of you who are joining us online, we make you particularly welcome. And a special welcome back to Mrs. Hazel Roney, and we're delighted um, that she's able to share the service with us this morning, um, particularly as I know she's been um, from dawn to dusk for the last few days at conference, conference um, so we greatly appreciate her input here this morning. Just a couple of announcements. Um, next Sunday morning at 10.30, um, the uh, service will be read, led by the Reverend Philip Gallagher, um, and that will probably be the last we'll see of Philip for a couple of months because he goes on a three-month sabbatical uh, and will be back again until late September. So that's next Sunday morning, uh, the Reverend Philip Gallagher. And then some of you may be aware of the Gettys uh, Sing Conference uh, and concert being held on Friday and Saturday. The concert at the SSE Arena is uh, fairly full. Uh, I think there's still a few tickets available. Um, but I would just like to draw your attention particularly to the conference on uh, Friday evening uh, between 6 and 10. Um, it's a conference which will be filled with singing, creative artistry, Bible teaching and vital conversations on the beauty of the songs and the urgent calling of the Great Commission. As we lift our voices together we will celebrate the power of hymns in our local church contexts around the globe and into future generations and there's a wide number of people taking part from uh, the Gettys themselves. Uh, John Lennox, um, a well-known uh, Bible scholar, uh, Joni Eriks and Tada um, will be on live link uh, there as well, as well as Jeremy Begbie, Matt Papa and Matt Boswell. So it uh, is likely to be a very informative and blessed time on Friday evening at 6 at the SSE Arena and then the concerts on Saturday at 7.30. And then also just to say a very big thank you uh, to Iris for this beautiful uh, patchwork Okay, hanging on the wall, uh, which I'm sure you've noticed, um, and it's a great addition uh, to our church. You might remember the announcements in prayer. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. <clears throat> Good morning, Lily. Good morning. Lovely to be here. It's such a beautiful morning. The sun's not shining brightly, but it's really balmy. Uh, it feels a little bit tropical, actually. Uh, which is just lovely. I note, Nigel, your announcement about the event on Friday evening. Uh, and last Monday, Bobby and I decided we would take a run up to the North Coast. And as you do, you always stop at Logan's for a cup of coffee at that famous watering hole. So as we were drinking coffee, I heard this voice behind me. And I thought, I recognise that voice. And it was Professor John Lennox. <laughs> So he's obviously here already, uh, uh, so and that would be a wonderful occasion. It's also a wonderful occasion for me to join with you here in Glen uh, this morning. It's my great privilege, and uh, after, we just finished conference last night about 8 o'clock, and we had a very good conference. Uh, we had a wonderful uh, installation service with uh, David Turtle from Lisburn on Friday evening, and then last night was closed up with the um, ordination. Uh, there were five, five ordinance new young ministers going out to take up uh, their calling and that's something to be really uh, rejoicing over. So greetings from the whole connection of Irish Methodism. I'm sure Philip will fill you in on any things he thinks you need to know. But it's my great delight to be with you here this morning. And we're going to open by singing a wonderful hymn we sang yesterday in conference. It's number 19 in Mission Praise. All praise to our redeeming Lord.
Let's pray together. Our gracious, eternal Heavenly Father, as we gather in this place this morning, <clears throat> this precious place, this place where worship has happened for many, many, many years. We are aware of the incredible privilege that is ours as a people called Methodist, that we have the freedom to be here. And the only thing in our context that will keep us from being here would be our own carelessness. And so, Lord, we want to worship you this morning. We want to own your name. We want to own the fact that we believe in the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus. We give you thanks for the revelation that has come to us as recorded for us in Holy Scripture. We give you thanks for that whole narrative that runs right through from Genesis to Revelation. That you desire to call out a people for yourself, a holy people, a people who will witness to the incredible grace of the gospel and show the world your great love. And Father, we worship you because you alone are worthy of our worship. And we give you thanks, the whole Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for the coming of Jesus as a man, for the wonder of the Incarnation, for the mystery of the cross and the atonement, for the glory of the resurrection and the ascension, for the wonder of Pentecost and the coming of the gracious Holy Spirit, for the birth of the church in which we are involved. And so we worship you and we embrace these truths with all our hearts. And we pray that in this morning hour, in this simple service, that you by your spirit would be amongst us, that you would strengthen us, that you would fortify us in our most holy faith, and that we'll go away having heard your voice and determined to live and speak and work for you. And so we raise our voices together and to pray as Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I want to read from the Psalms um, this morning from a very well-known Psalm, Psalm 8. Uh, it's a beautiful Psalm. I love this Psalm and I, I noticed, I'm not even sure if it's there and I may have said this to you before, but if you're ever down or up around Port Stewart, around the harbour, and you look at the little boats, there's a wee boat in there somewhere called Psalm 8. Uh, so keep your eye out for it the next time you're up. So here, Hear this lovely psalm, a psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise. Because of your enemies, to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honour. You made him ruler over the works of your hands, 
he put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds, and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and all that swim the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It's a beautiful psalm. It's just short, but it's beautiful. And I love it. I love reading it. It's, it's just a wonderful, it's a wonderful psalm. Uh, the conference this weekend is about the place of hymns and worship and so on. And if you look at the beginning of that, that's written for the director of music. So that was sent to the musicians. So they put it together and then the people of God would sing. So we're going to sing now. We're going to sing uh, uh, something that has its roots right here in Northern Ireland. Uh, and you know when Bobby and I went to the Far East, uh, when the very early weeks that we were there, it's the strangest feeling to arrive into a culture that is so alien, you don't speak the language, etc., etc., to small children. We attended this service of worship, and the opening hymn was, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Uh, only it was in Indonesian, Abitaman Babi Yesus, and I think I cried. So it's a wonderful hymn. Uh, the writer, of course, uh, is honoured over in Banbridge. And it was written out of sorrow and stress. Uh, but we stand to sing. What a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> Thank you. 
only be forgotten son. And whoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. And for that great gift, we are grateful. And in gratitude, we bring our tithes and offerings. We give you thanks for our food, for our homes, for the, the, the provision that we have every day. And we're mindful of those across the world who are not so fortunate. And so we dedicate these offerings to you in the lovely name of Jesus. And we pray that they will be yours so that others too will not perish, but have everlasting life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Concern. 
and there are many things within the church that are giving us cause for rejoicing. And so we just want to take a minute to remember our context in the world that we live in. It's a perplexing world. And while there are no young people and children here this morning, we can pray for the young people and children who are attached to our families, who are living in a really challenging world, who, who inhabit a really challenging environment right now. I think we, we are a generation back a bit who were more fortunate than they. The sheer weight of social media and all of it, I don't need to tell you about it, you know, that is crashing on the minds of our young people is truly a huge challenge. Having said that, just yesterday it was lovely to watch young people taking part in our conference. Last night, young people partnered with older people to serve communion to all the gathered community. So we always need to keep a balance. So let's let's come to God in prayer now as we come to our intercession. Gracious Father, we are conscious as we address you as Father, what an incredible privilege that is. And, and what comfort it is that we, as a group of your people, gathered here in the Navy this morning, can lift up our eyes to the Creator God and address you as our Father. And we have come in the name of Jesus to bring our concerns and our burdens for the world around us. And Father, as we look across the whole spectrum of international affairs, sometimes our hearts feel. Lord, as we watch Ukraine and Russia and the vast fallout of that conflict and the unnecessary uh, uh, conflict that it is, our, our hearts are broken. And Lord, for all the people who are suffering this morning, the awful vagaries of war, for the children who were taken away, for the people who are injured, for those who have lost loved ones, for those whose whole homes and livelihoods and towns and villages have been uh, destroyed, for that huge disaster this week with the dam. And the, uh, Lord, our words fail us, so we call on you, Lord, and we pray for your people in that place as they seek to minister to others, as they seek to uh, uh, try to put together some kind of living. Lord, we cry that the international community, working behind the scenes, will be able to bring to some kind of a revolution this madness. Lord, we, we don't have the words, and so we just lift up our hearts to you and in the mighty name of Jesus we pray that all the talks and all the influence of all those who are involved that there will be a, re a resolution to this awful war and Lord as we look also to Sudan and, and, and the other areas surrounding that again our hearts almost fail Lord the uh, food insecurity again the craziness of war the, recklessness of men who, who visit us on their communities. Lord, we pray again that some kind of reason will, will uh, prevail in this situation. And Lord, our hearts turn as we see hundreds of thousands of people across our globe displaced. There's nowhere to call home. And Lord, you know what it was like to run away as someone seeking asylum. Lord, we pray for all our governments, and we don't underestimate the difficulty of it, but we pray for wisdom, and we pray that our Judeo-Christian background here in Western Europe will stand us in good stead as we show mercy to those who need it. Father, we pray for our governments. We pray for European government, we pray for our British government, we pray for the devolved governments in Scotland and Wales and here and we pray for the Irish government and for all those who carry the weight 
of, of government. And as we especially want to pray again for our little province that we would soon see our devolved government back in place. Lord, we pray for all those in public service. Even those, Lord, who don't know you, don't name your name. But those who do, Lord, that they would honour you in all their thinking and doing. And, Lord, that we could come to a place of some kind of equilibrium and peace. And, Father, we pray for our young people. Especially this time of year when they're just finishing exams and when stress is high. And Lord, for all the young people attached to all our families and our churches, for all our youth leaders, all our Sunday school teachers, all those who bring influence to bear on our young people, we pray. We pray for a mighty outpouring of your Spirit across our land, because only the power of your Spirit can stand up to the tide that is engulfing us. And so we pray for our children and our young people. We pray, Lord, for those who are not here this morning because of health or age. And we pray that in their place, perhaps as they listen online, Lord, that they would be blessed, that their soul, Lord, would be refreshed, and that their faith would be strengthened. Finally, Lord, we pray for our Methodist Church. We pray for our new president, David Turtle. We pray for our lay leader, Tom Wilson, our secretary, Heather Morris. We pray for all the diverse committees that work so hard across this denomination. We pray for the leaders of this society, for all those who gather here, Lord, that we will, regardless of the circumstances around us, be faithful, even unto death. Lord, we bring all these prayers to you. In the lovely name of Jesus. Amen. I want to read a spectacular passage of scripture. Uh, some of you may even know it. Uh, it's one of those passages that whenever people used to memorize scripture, uh, uh, it would have been one of those favorite passages. Philippians chapter 2. You know, if, if I, I was in Rich Hill actually preaching last week and someone was reminding me of a sermon that I had preached quite a long time ago somewhere else. And uh, this person said to me, do you know Hazel, I'd love to hear that sermon again. And we were laughing and I said, you know, if I was called, if I arrived and I was just called on very quickly, I said, look, there's no preacher here this morning, you're going to have to preach. There'd be a couple of places I would just say, right, okay. One of them would be John 4, which is the woman at the well, which is the one we were discussing. And here would be another one, Philippians chapter 2. So here this spectacular passage of scripture from the pen of, or the quill or whatever it was, of the great apostle Paul. It has to be said that this was in the context of a bit of conflict in the church. There had been some disagreements, and we wouldn't know anything about that. There had been some disagreements. Paul's writing, and this is how he addresses it. He says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, do you know there's three sermons in those few lines? If you have any of that, he says, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Don't do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. That is spectacular writing. But then he, he, Paul takes off sometimes and he says this, he says, your attitude 
should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And then it, now it's possible that what comes next was already in existence. And he was quoting a very, very early hymn that was existent around the church. But we're not sure. But here's what he said. Your attitude being the same as that of Christ Jesus, then listen to this, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And then listen to this. I love this line. And being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, that's Paul's great therefore. God exalted him to the highest place. And give him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. By anybody's standard, that is a spectacular piece of writing. And I never tire reading it. I like reading it publicly. And you know, I could nearly say, well, we'll just sing the closing hymn and we'll all go. Because, it, and you can think about it all afternoon, because it is a wonderful hymn to Christ. It's, it's, there are, there are four passages in the New Testament. There's John 1, there's Philippians 2, there's Colossians 1, and there's Hebrews 1. And they all make the, the most great Christological passages that, that point us to the person of Christ. And it's the person of Christ who stands at the centre of our faith. That's why we are called Christians. Christ in. The early Christians were referred to as Christianoi and they were seen as a bit of a nuisance, just another sect of those funny Jewish people. They'd be a bit of a nuisance and they would finally go away. Well, that didn't work. And so we're here in Glenavie this morning. Now, <clears throat> I get quite a lot of emails and communication from all sorts of places. And one of those places is from uh, the Lausanne Mutant Movement. Now, the Lausanne Movement, just, I'm not going to spend much time explaining it to you, but it's a wonderful movement uh, of, for the evangelical faith. And Dr. John Stott was one of the great founders of it. And they had a, an amazing conference way back, I think, in the 60s looking at how to proclaim, you know, the, the incredible gospel of Christ. And they, they, they produce wonderful resources. And I get a monthly email with all kinds of resources, and I really appreciate it. Back in January, their email came through, and they had a number of links you can click on, and there are great articles and so on. And, and one of them took my eye. And it was written by a man whose name I can't pronounce, but it doesn't matter. And he had written 10 questions that will shape the church going towards 2050. How, how are we to steward the Great Commission in the decades ahead? Now, 2050, I'll not be here. And you can say to me, will you wear your hair about that for you? But the thing about this, that's never an option for us. We, we constantly are cons con and, uh, watching the trends of the Christian church. Now, of those 10 questions, by the way, I'm not going to read you 10 questions because each of them is quite long. But the first one took my eye. And here it is. And the question is, what does it mean to be human? And that's a very relevant question. 
and I'm quoting now directly from the writer. Observable trends we see in the world today include advances in artificial intelligence. Now, if you haven't heard about artificial intelligence recently, you're not listening to the news. This is a big story right now. Part of it is fascinating and part of it is frightening. So, artificial intelligence, biomedical engineering, gene editing, nanotechnology. If you know what that is, you can let me know on the way out, because I don't, but it sounds awesome. Robotics, abortion legislation. Did you hear the news this week? That our Secretary of State is going to oblige our secondary schools to provide our children with information about abortion. Gender, sexual and racial identity. These key emerging trends reveal the underlying question the world is asking from multiple angles. What does it mean to be human? Each of the trends above hold the potential to question the meaning of humanity actively. But combined, the question of what does it mean to be human is a fundamental question of our era and a question that will change the context of the gospel message. It will change the gospel message, but it will change the context. As we redefine humanity, Many secondary questions for the Great Commission emerge. Any of they are, and I'm still holding. How do we share the need for God's sovereignty and salvation when anyone can simply edit out perceived defects in ourselves or in our surroundings? What does it mean to have an identity in Christ when we can create our own sociological and biological identity? How do we communicate the uniqueness of the Christian God amid the rise of the new pseudo-technological gods made in our image? And ultimately, what is the relationship between man and God, creature and creator? This question about who and what we are will be at the core of the contextual gospel proclamation and discipleship in the coming decades. That's relevant to all of us. There might be some very big uh, words in there and we think, what is she going on about? But those are the realities that surround us and our children, our young people in the world that we live in. What does it mean to be human? It's a very modern question, but it's also a very, very old one. Because the quest for reality and significance is not new, but is very current. A man's place in the universe is a constant source of wonder and speculation. Now, <clears throat> I don't know if you think very much about world views and how you acquire a worldview. And a worldview is simply how we view the world and ourselves and our place in it. How we view other human beings and how we treat them. Where do we come from? Do we have any significance? And do we have a duty? And then we turn to Psalm 8. A very ancient song one written by David a way back all those centuries before. And it's bookended by two beautiful statements. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And then it goes on, and that's the last verse as well. And then he goes on and, and he, he, he uses this language that is exalted and uplifting. 
So he's talking to God. How majestic is your name? And others recognizing the sheer otherness of God. And the, the Jewish people brought this incredible understanding of God. And we are Judeo-Christian. We have that same understanding of God. It's, it is uplifting language, yet it is incredibly personal. Because the thing about it is, the writer of this psalm knew himself to be in a covenant relationship with this majestic God. That's the difference with other gods. That's the difference if you worship the sun or the moon or whatever. Because this God has entered into a covenant relationship with these people. Oh God, our God. He is our God. That's the unique thing about the Judeo-Christian revelation is that God desires to have a relationship with his creation. And the psalmist goes on and he says, you've set your glory above the heavens. He's acknowledging creation. Genesis starts with, in the beginning, God. And God spoke a cosmos into being. That's the basis of our worldview. There is a creator. This God, this almighty God, who desires to enter into a personal relationship with you and me and desires to call out a people for himself. Today it's the church. Not just the Methodist church. The church of Jesus Christ across the world. He says, you have ordained, uh, uh, from the lips of children and infants, you've ordained praise and so on. I mean, Jesus quoted that uh, uh, on, uh, I think it was Palm Sunday. But he mentions, he goes on to talk about the creation. Listen to these beautiful verses. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. Now that's, that, that's a place just to pause because when we look at creation so we, we talk about the big bang we, people want to do all kinds of things we've actually got to the place now where we've had to recognize that there was a beginning but there was a, this, this gentleman is dead now there was a gentleman a, a great a, he was a church of England director I think he was also a great scientist thinker and apologetic in either Cambridge or Oxford. He would be a buddy with John Lennox, actually, but he died a couple of years ago. His name was John Polkinghorne. At Queen's College, Cambridge, actually, is where it was. And here's what, here's what he tells us about the created order of the world that we live in. He says this, for us to be possible, us to be possible, right? requires a balance between the effects of expansion and contraction. Just stick with me. I would, couldn't write this in a thousand years, but he's a clever guy. At the very early epoch of the universe's history, says it has to differ by not more than one in 10 to the power of 60. Do you know what that means to me? Nothing. I could never do that. Did anybody know about the power of what? I hated that at school. It was a mystery. But he knows. But listen, he goes on. Now he says, the numerate, that's those of you who are good at that stuff, will marvel at such a degree of accuracy. But for the non-numerate, that's me, he explains what this accuracy means. He says, it is the same as aiming at a target an inch wide on the other side of the observable universe 20,000 million light years away and hitting it bullseye. That is how likely it is for the intricacies of the, the, the earth that we live in to have exactly the right balance that allows us to exist. That's 
how that's the chances there are of that actually happening by chance. It's called the anthropic principle. And we live in a universe whose constitution is precisely adjusted to the narrow limits which alone make it capable of being our home. Here's what Isaiah said. For this is what the Lord said, He who created the heavens, He is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, He founded it. He didn't create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. That's Isaiah saying in his theological and poetical way, the same as John Paul Gingham is saying in his very complicated numbers. Because the creation of God's hand is spectacular. And the psalmist says in his beautiful song, whenever I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, but then he asks the question, and this is why I'm getting to where I'm talking about what does it mean to be human. He says, what is man that you're mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? So the God who, who created this cosmos that is so finely balanced and this, this planet that we live in that is actually attuned and balanced so that we can have our existence uh, 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 and all the rhythms of night and day and seasons and all the rest of it, this God is mindful of you and I as individuals. Or the Son of Man, that you care for him. This writer, this psalmist, recognized the amazing wonder of God, but he also recognized that incredible relationship between God and his people. And he goes on to say, You made him river over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. All the flocks and herds and beasts of the field, the birds of the earth, fish of the sea, and all that swim in the paths of the sea. Because it was to man alone that God afforded the planet. Man, God was, man was his great vice regent. That's why we have great concern today about how we treat the planet. That's why in the Judeo-Christian uh, understanding of things, there was a care about how we treated animals. You made them a little lower than the heavenly beings. You crowned him with glory and honour. That's man. Someone has translated that and said, you made him with a little bit of God left out. Because we were made in God's image. And we were made to express the wonder and the life of God. For God placed us. It is an incredible worldview that we hold. Humans are less than God, but they're closer to God than anything else in the created order. See, we want to, nowadays in the great secular movements that are happening, we just want to put man at the kind of the top of the, the tree with all the other animals. So that's not what Christianity, Christianity believes, not what the Bible teaches. More than anything, any, more than any other creatures, humans reflect and represent God. God crowned humanity as image bearer with glory and honour. And so there is not only the great honour that God, there is the function. He put us as his great vice regent to care for this creation. But the truth at the centre of this psalm points forward to something else when we turn over to Philippians. And we have that great song that Paul quoted or composed into a context of an early church under Roman domination. And he spoke about the person of Christ. And he, says, he said that Jesus 
who being in very nature God, talking about the second person of the Trinity, God himself. But he didn't consider that something that he should pursue or chase after, but he made himself nothing, took the form of a servant, was made in human likeness, found in appearance as a man. There's the great centre of our faith. There's what makes us stand apart from other faith claims. That the God, that almighty God, that, that, that incredible God that the psalmist is talking about, actually, in the words of the founder of our denomination, Wesley, he said, our God was contracted to a span and incomprehensibly became man. So I love that line. Found in appearance as a man. This God who desires to be in a covenant relationship with people came amongst us as one of us. And not only that, he humbled himself and became obedient to death. And when he says even death on a cross, to those who were reading it in the context they were reading it, they knew the absolute heinous nature of the cross and crucifixion. But then Paul goes on to say this, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place. A few weeks ago we celebrated ascension. And we have that wonderful picture of the risen, this risen man, this risen incarnate Christ who returned to heaven as a risen man. That blows my mind up. God exalted him. He took our humanity back to the very center of heaven. He exalted him to the highest place, gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And then Paul, Paul calls, he had this great sense of, he had a huge canvas, and he, he calls all these images, he said, that every name in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue, whether willingly or unwillingly, will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That God, that man who took humanity on himself. And that will be to the glory of God the Father. What does it mean to be human? It means to be made and created in the image of God. And we know that that image was marred because man fell into sin. But we know that this man, this Christ, this Jesus, who being found in the likeness of a man and humbled himself and the mystery and the wonder of the crucifixion of Christ and the atonement and the forgiveness of our sins and the resurrected body of our Saviour, the ascended uh, uh, Christ and the coming of the Spirit is the most incredible message that the world will ever hear. So to be human is to be made in the image of God. To be human is to be redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. And to be human is to await the return of our Saviour. And scripture speaks about it as that great appearing. So in the midst of all the upsets and all the uh, uh, new technologies and all that goes on around us, we declare that we are made in Christ's image, in God's image, that Christ became one of us, that he went to the cross to take the price for our sins, and he rose again, and he bore the marks of that cross right to the very throne room of heaven. Look into the book of Revelation. I don't pretend to understand Revelation. It gives you blisters on your brain. But there's one thing that I know there are two dominant images. One of them is a throne, and the other is a lamb, looking as though it had been slain. The opening chapter of Revelation 
is a wonderful revelation of the risen Christ. So in the midst of all the things that concerns us, this is the gospel that we hold to. And that's where we find our succor, our help, and it's where we find our commission to go from this place and to proclaim with the psalmist, O Lord our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's pray for a moment. <coughs> Father, we bow before the revelation that we are incapable of actually doing it justice with words. So we quietly acknowledge that you made us for yourself and that you redeemed us because Jesus became one of us and bore our sin and has returned to the very courts of heaven where he has been afforded the highest place. And we thank you that one day our voices, our tongues will also confess with every other tongue that he is Lord. We give you thanks. Amen. We stand to sing our closing hymn, 452 in the book, but it is on the screen, Loved with Everlasting Love. Before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.